Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. Today we're in the third and uh, final part of a three week uh, message series called Circle Up. And uh, you may be wondering why I'm coming to you by way of video, uh, give you a little bit of background. I was scheduled uh, this Sunday to speak and to close out this series, but I also had scheduled uh, months and months ago to be away uh, with my son Nathaniel and we we're uh, trying backcountry camping for the first time ever. So we're trying something new. We're going on an adventure, and so that's where I am this morning. So I'm filming this a few days ahead because I was really excited about sharing this, this final message with you today. Today, I want to encourage you to perhaps try something new, to engage with your faith in a, in a new way. Uh, this message of Circle Up is really, um, this, this whole message series is really about kind of huddling up as a church. Uh, when you have a circle up, it's kind of like a team meeting and like a football team or many other sports teams. Uh, before the big game, before the big tournament, there's a huddle. And that's not the place to figure out new strategy or try trick plays. It's the time when the team is reminded of all the things that are essential uh, to succeed. And that's essentially what we wanted to do over this uh, three week series is really talk about some of the essential things that each and every one of us must have in our lives and what we must do as a community uh, to be able to move forward into this fall and into the upcoming year um, in a way that is that is most helpful for us and for the mission of our church. So if you haven't been with us a couple of weeks ago, I opened up the series talking about finding your center. We talked about the importance of what is at the center of your life and heart. And the thing that's at the center of your life actually impacts every other area of your life. And, and what I said in that first week is that God must be at the center. Um, Jesus uh, did not recommend that we have him at the center of our lives. He demanded it. He said, if, if anyone loves mother or father, if anyone loves their son or daughter, if anyone loves anything more than me, not worthy of me. So it's pretty strong. And Jesus said those words because he knew that since he is first, he is preeminent, anything else that we place at the center of our lives, hearts, families, finances, anything that's there that isn't him, will ultimately cause our life to spiral out of control. And so having him at the center is the first step for any of us. The, the great commandment we, we learned about, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with your all your mind. Okay, that was the first commandment. And so that's what we talked about in week one, making God the center of everything. Last week in week two, we talked about finding your people and choosing the right people. We talked about the power of environment, that the places that we choose to be and the people that we surround ourselves actually impact where we end up. And so again, when we make God the center of our lives, that's an inside out transformation. When he's the center, it transforms how we spend our time, our money, our friends, all that. But then there's an outside in transformation. The people that we surround ourselves really, really seriously impact where we end up. Every parent knows it. And to be honest, you and I know it too. The places we spend our time, the people we surround ourselves will determine where we end up in the long run. You can have great intentions, great intentions for loving and serving God for the next five years. But if you're in the wrong place and you're surrounded with the wrong people, the chances of you becoming all that God has called you to be and doing all that God has called you to do is pretty much zero. So we wanna set God at the center. We wanna surround ourselves with the right people. And if we do those two things, uh, those two things actually set us up for something. They set us up uh, to make a difference, to have an impact on the world. Jesus said that we're to be the light of the world, that we're to be the salt of the earth, that we're supposed to have an impact on the people around us. So we circle up at church and we encourage one another so that we can go back to our families, to our jobs, to our schools and actually make a difference so that our faith is impacting those around us. So we got to have God at the center. We got to have the right people, but we also want to make sure that we're having an impact on our world. Faith in Christianity is not just about believing certain things about God. It's not just about adhering to certain doctrines. It's actually about how we live and what we do. And so we take the teachings of Christ and we live them out in community and in our city. Our text for today is actually uh, found in John chapter 13. And this passage I'm about to read to you are the words of Jesus. And on the night that he was betrayed and would uh, go to the cross, he had a, a last supper with his disciples in an upper room. And on that night, he sort of shared with his disciples some really, really key thoughts. And as you're gonna see today, a command. And I want us to consider it today. He says this, a new command I give you. So we know we love the Lord, yeah, yeah. Love neighbor as self, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, a new command I give you, and here it is. Love one another. 
Can we all say that together? I know I'm not in the room, but let's all say it together. Love one another. I can just imagine Jesus sitting, they would have been sitting on the floor, eating with their hands. And Jesus and disciples would have been around some sort of table. And I could just imagine Jesus saying, okay, all disciples, I want you to look into each other's eyes. Oh, Jesus, that's awkward. That's kind of creepy. Yeah, I know. Look into each other's eyes. Okay, I want you, everyone, I want you to look at Peter. I know Peter can be a, a, a strong and sometimes arrogant and pushy and impulsive. But I want you to love him because you need him. Okay, okay, I want everyone to look at John, right? And John might have been, been looked at as the, you know, the teacher's pet, you know, he was like Jesus' favorite or whatever it was perceived. He's like, I want you to look at John. I love him and I want you to love him too. Oh, hey, there's Matthew. Matthew's attention to details, kind of persnickety sometimes, drive everybody crazy. I want you to look into his eyes, love one another. And I'm going to ask you guys to do something that might seem a bit awkward. I want you to look around the room, lock eyes with somebody, okay? I know this is weird. Just lock eyes with somebody in the room, maybe somebody you came with. And I want you to hear the words of Jesus. A new command I give you, love one another. Friends, if we can't love the people in the row with us, sitting on the couch next to us at home, if we can't love these people, there's no way we're going to be able to love the people outside the walls of this church and in our community. So Jesus says, love one another. That's the command. And then he says, he qualifies it. We don't get to choose how we love one another. I wish we could, but we don't. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, this would add different context for them for this reason. Right before Jesus says this to his disciples, as they were coming into the room, Jesus disrobes. So he's wearing essentially his underwear. He'd have a wrap around his, his, his body. And Jesus gets down on his hands, on his knees, and he begins to take the role of a servant. And in those days, if you had a servant or a slave, they would wash all the muck off your feet as you came into a house. And Jesus gets down and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And they're like, Jesus, no, no, we should be washing your feet. He says, no, let me do this. And what Jesus is doing is he's illustrating what it looks like to serve and love one another. Before he says this new commandment, he demonstrates what it actually looks like. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that today we're going to wash each other's feet. Okay. What I am saying is the posture of a servant and being willing to serve the people in our community, the people in our row, the children and families of our church is significant. It's not just recommended. It's demanded by Christ. We must love one another as he has loved us. And then he goes on to say this in verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. He says the thing that the world, people outside the church, will first recognize about those who follow me is their love for one another, their commitment to serving, their humility. Those are the things that people will notice and he says, and they will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. What I'm talking about today as we close out this series is being willing to engage, being willing to serve, being willing to take the posture of humility and do what is best for other people. You know, in Israel, there's a body of water called the Dead Sea. And the Jordan River will throw a map up, but the Jordan River flows through Israel and down to, I believe it's the lowest point on earth that isn't underwater. Okay, and it's called the Dead Sea. And all the water flows in and the salt from in that water flows into the Dead Sea. But the, the problem with the Dead Sea is there's no outflow. The water just stays there and then the water evaporates and the salt remains. And I'm told that the salt concentration in the Dead Sea is 10 times higher than the ocean, which means nothing will live there. No fish, no frogs, no seaweed. Seaweed grows everywhere. No seaweed growing anywhere. Why? Because the salt content is so high. And the reason why the sea is dead is because there's no outflow. And honestly, there are so many people who will be tempted to come to church, tempted to read our Bible, circle up around the wrong, all the right people. But if we never engage in service to others, if we never have any outflow, if there's no generosity, if there's no love, we become stagnant and salty. And that's not what I want uh, for you. So my challenge for you today as we close out this series is I want to challenge you to get into the ring. And that's an old term uh, that people sometimes use to get into the ring. And, it, and it, it actually means that you're willing to enthusiastically get involved. It's kind of a boxing term because you would get into the ring. And once you got in there, I mean, you were in for, in for a fight. Now, it's interesting that they call a boxing ring a ring when it's actually a square. But I thought I might bring this up since it's, we're talking about circles. Uh, I looked this up to figure out why they call a ring a ring when it's really a square. And its origins seem to be the fact that in the olden days, they would draw a line in a ring on the earth or in the dirt 
and two opponents would wrestle or fight or box inside that ring and the crowd would surround and cheer them on. And so the name just sort of stuck. But I wanna encourage you to get in the ring, to engage with your faith. Uh, years ago, I boxed for the first time. I was a teenager and I was at camp and a bunch of the volunteers, uh, a bunch of teenagers, we were all in this cabin together. And one of the guys brought a, a couple sets of these boxing gloves. And of course I had never boxed before, but I mean, I'd seen Muhammad Ali on TV. I mean, how hard could it be, right? I had that old Nintendo game, Mike Tyson's Knockout or whatever it was called. And uh, you know, it was easy. You had the big bald bull and when he shook his head, you uppercut him and that was it. It was so easy. So I thought this is gonna be fun. I put on the gloves and uh, me and this guy are just kind of like boxing. We're just kind of having fun with it. A couple jabs, a couple punches, you know, here and there, bam, bam, bam. And then all of a sudden uh, he moved the wrong direction and I clipped him on the chin and something changed in his eyes. He looked at me like, you're going down. And the next thing I remember, I'm on the ground. I got my, I got my gloves over my head and I'm just trying to defend myself as he's throwing haymakers. Like he's just pounding me. And as I'm on the floor getting punched, even as a teenager, I was writing sermons because in my head I was thinking to myself, oh, like boxing's harder than it looks. <laughs> I know it should be obvious, but it's actually harder than it looks. And the truth of the matter is a lot of things in life are harder than they look. Playing tennis is harder than it looks. Uh, I, I was thinking about this when I was a young man. I worked in a factory and the boss would walk through and make suggestions. And I thought, dude, you don't even know what you're doing. I thought all the ways that he could improve the company. And then later I got to become an owner and a manager in a similar kind of company. And I realized it was harder than it looks. I used to see parents with toddlers in the grocery store. Kids are freaking out. Parents are trying to calm them down. And I thought, learn how to parent, man. That's what I thought. And then, and then later when I was the one with the toddler screaming in the cart, I realized it's harder than it looks, right? Teaching in class. I mean, they get their summers off. How hard could it be, right? Teaching in class is harder than it looks. Thought I'd get an amen from a few people in the crowd on that one. You get the point. So many things in life are actually harder and harder than they first appear. So I'm thinking about that as I'm getting beat down. Second thing I'm thinking about is how different it is watching from being involved. It's very, very different. There's a difference between watching something and doing something, right? Huge difference. And I, I don't wanna be one of those people who are up in the peanut gallery. Okay, that's an old expression that comes from the days of vaudeville. Okay, they would have these shows and all the wealthy people would be sitting in the box seats and they'd be sitting in the front rows. And then you had the middle-class people kind of towards the back. And then there might be a balcony with some benches and all the cheap seats were there. And that was the rowdy crowd. I mean, they would be throwing vegetables, throwing peanut shells down, complaining about the, the, the quality of the show. And so you got this, this idea of these people that are in the back being difficult, critical. And I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to be the kind of person who's engaged. I want to be the kind of person who's in the fight, who's, who's on the ground making a difference. You know, sometimes I think as Christians, we, we give people the wrong idea. We, we talk about faith like, hey, if you trust in Jesus, if you follow Jesus, everything will be great. I mean, you could just, you know, put your feet up, relax, and, and he's gonna take care of everything. But that's not actually what Jesus said, and that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, what we discover as we open up the scriptures is that God has invited us to work with him. He's invited us on a mission. He's invited us to put on the armor of God and to fight evil forces. He's, he's called us to make a difference in our communities, to give, to serve, to love. The point is, we have to do it with them. And so many times we get the, the cart in front of the horse where we're trying to make a difference in the world, but we're not doing it with him and we're not doing it for him. And one of my favorite passages is found in Matthew 11. I've preached on it before. And it actually says this, Jesus turns to the crowd and he says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. And if that's the only verse you read, you might think to yourself, <laughs> I can put my feet up and relax. But here's what Jesus says next. He says, take my yoke upon you. Now, for those that are unfamiliar, a yoke is a, an instrument of work. A yoke is a way that uh, we're able to attach two oxen, two horses together so that they can pull in tandem as a unit. And Jesus doesn't say, you don't have to work if you follow me. Jesus actually says, come and work with me. Come and work for me. I'm gonna teach you, I'm gonna support you, I'm gonna strengthen you, and we're gonna to work together. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We're supposed to do work. We're supposed to be on mission. 
but we're supposed to be doing it with him. I was watching a uh, YouTube video uh, this week, surprise, surprise, and uh, it was actually a TED Talk uh, by uh, a gentleman that was talking about the power of volunteering. And this was not a Christian person, and it was fascinating to me to hear him talk about three different things that you get out of serving. And he actually goes on to talk about how um, when you volunteer, of course, with the right heart, right? Doing it out of love. When you volunteer, when you serve others in this way, it actually has mental and physical health benefits. Some people are like, you know, someday when I get my life together, I'll do something to help someone else. But the truth is, one of the ways to get your life together is actually to help and serve somebody else. And so you start small and you start to give of yourself and it changes everything. Jesus himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so when we turn outwards, right? We've got Christ at the center, right community, and then we turn and we begin to circle out and serve others. And when we do that, it actually helps us. Second thing, you learn new skills, right? When you, when you hang out with other people and you're doing things together, you're gonna learn. And thirdly, you're gonna build relationships. Many of the people that attend our church have built relationships and part of their circle that they've surrounded themselves with are people that they've served with and gotten to know through serving, you know? We believe in sitting around and praying, reading the Bible together, of course, we encourage that. But there's something about working together, about getting calluses on your hands with other people, doing something for others, for the church or for the community with other people. It's a powerful, powerful thing in our lives. I wanted to let you know about this on November 6th, so it's about a month away, we're gonna have our Mission Sunday. I'm so excited about this because today we're talking about some of the opportunities and needs for our church family. And after a time of worship, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna talk about our property, and I'm gonna talk about some of the needs that we have right now. We need your help. But before I do, it's really important for you to know that uh, what I really want is for you to get in the ring. I want you to get engaged with your faith and I want you to serve. And for many of you that will be here within Pathway Church in our ministries, and for others, it may be serving outside of Pathway Church. The point is you need to serve, you need to give, you need to do something. And on November 6th, we have our Mission Sunday, and we're gonna have local ministry partners and some of our overseas missionary partners uh, present to give us updates. And then you're gonna have the opportunity to chat with them. And maybe some of you, God will be calling you to serve and support them and to go and to do uh, some different things here within our community. So there's going to be lots of service opportunities, lots of connections to be made in the near future. But I want to let you know about that. And I'll close with this and then I'm going to pray and we're going to turn it over to worship. Um, our band's going to come up in, in just a moment and they're going, to, they're going to lead you in a time of worship. Because again, um, one of the ways that we engage with our faith is through prayer. And one of the ways that we engage with our faith is through worshiping God. I didn't say standing and listening to the band sing. I said worshiping God. And that's something you and I are called to do. But I, I was thinking about this. Um, I've been watching this uh, series called The Chosen, okay? And it's about Jesus and his disciples. I've really enjoyed it. We've watched it with our kids and uh, really gotten a lot out of it. Now, I need to say, not everything in the series is biblical. It's mostly biblical. And then they add narrative and they add, uh, you know, character development and stuff in there. But there's this one scene, I think it's in the second season, and the camera is just panning around a fire and all the disciples are sitting around talking. Okay. They're talking to each other. They're talking about politics. They're talking about ministry. They're talking about life. They're talking about their doubts and fears. Like they're just talk, 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 talk. And the whole time I'm thinking, where's this going? And at the end of the scene, just talk, 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 talk. Jesus comes walking out of the darkness because he's been off ministering to people, healing people, praying for people, feeding people, whatever he was doing. Jesus comes walking in exhausted from serving, walks past the disciples, goes into his tent, prays and thanks God and goes to sleep. And that's the episode. And at first I thought, well, that was, that was kind of anticlimactic. It was like, well, that really? That's the episode? And then it dawned on me what they were trying to do. They were trying to contrast the difference between people that talk and people that do. And Jesus was not sitting there talking about stuff. He was serving and loving people. And he expended his energy there. And he invites us to work with him and to expend our energy there. I don't, I would much rather have some people with calluses on their hands than with silver tongues. I want to have people surrounding me and I want to be the kind of person that gives my life away for others, that serves. And so I don't know what that's going to look like for you today. As we're 
Finishing this Circle Up series this morning, three things. Number one, God needs to be the center of your life. Number two, you need the right people surrounding you. And number three, you gotta do something. You have to do something with what he's given you. Your talents, your abilities, your resources, you must do something and it's in doing something, it's in giving, it's in loving that you continue to grow and become and experience all that God has for you. So I'm gonna pray and the band is gonna lead you in a time of worship. Again, my hope for you this morning is this, as you stand, that you, would, that you would engage in worship, that you would worship the living God, that you would open your heart to Him, that maybe while everyone is singing, you would have a moment of prayer with Him and ask the Lord what it is that He would have you to do, what needs to change in your life, and take the right step today. Let me pray. Father, thank you for each and every person in the room today, everyone listening online. And I pray, Lord, that today, as as we're here in this place and as we're in this moment, that you'd speak to us. That's been our prayer for three weeks. Just speak to us, Lord. Just show us our next step. Whether something in our heart needs to be adjusted, whether it's something in our circle that needs to be adjusted, or maybe it's, maybe it's something that we're doing or not doing that needs to be adjusted. And so, God, we ask that you would help us with that. May our lives uh, reflect your light, your salt, May there be some outflow from our lives. And God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Help us to love as you have loved us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Would you stand and join our team as they lead us in worship this morning?